All right. Welcome back to the Marcus Milioni podcast. I think we'll probably go. We are. I think we'll undergo a bit of a name change here soon since Sean's a uh, mainstay on the on the pod now. I lurk in but, the shadows. <laughs> we, uh, we're lucky to be joined uh, by Charlie Sisiak. Saying that right? His last name? It is Sisiak. Okay. Sisiak. Good try. <laughs> yeah. Man, last names are, are hard for me. Um, he is the founder of Good Wipes, which started as like a... I guess a wipe for your your bum and then expanded into uh personal care um and you're continually expanding but before we jump like way too far into just growth of a business and kind of that whole thing definitely want to hear early life growing up like you know about you in general and and kind of see how it it relates to business and and life cool yeah well, first of all, dude, thank you so much for having me. Uh, big fan from afar. I, mean, I just, I, you have this character and it is flawless. Like the hair, the affinity for Stephanie, the apparel, it is fantastic. Uh, and yeah, it's like, I, good job. Are you like chewing on one of those little blocks? <laughs> the whole thing it really works. And, um, yeah, I just, I love it. I think it's good stuff. I appreciate and Sean, it. Sean, pleasure to meet you as well, my man. Pleasure to meet you. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I think the the punchline is yes. Wipes for the past eight years. I love it. And I think if I look back on my life and my upbringing, I had two like, really good parents. Uh, I was an only child. My parents loved me well. They a high level of confidence in me, but they also ensured that like, I didn't have a high level of entitlement. I think a lot of times when you're like a child, like, oh, holy child, like, he's going to get what he wants, or he's gonna get if he doesn't. I think my parents did a really good job in ensuring that, like, we we kind of, like, earned what we, kept what we earned, right? Mm. And we had to work for it. And I think early on, I learned that. And, you know, I wasn't, I didn't have a lemonade stand when I was four, and just like our hustle and Jolly Ranchers, and Jolly Ranchers in kindergarten. <laughs> um, but my dad is a contractor. And yeah, early on like in high school and through college, I went to college in the same city, Tallahassee at Florida State. I would subcontract for my dad and do his like demo and his cleanup. And I would hire my friends. I would like bid for my dad and I'd be like, hey, this is going to cost like 3000 bucks. And then I would t- I'd call my friends like, hey, I know everyone's like complaining about bar money. 15 bucks an hour and only clean up a bunch of stuff. Uh, and so, yeah, early on, I, I think I, I developed kind of like a yearning for leadership and kind of creating my own economy. Uh, my business partner now, Sam Eagle, uh, we hit it off in college. We did nightlife entertainment and marketing together. We brought like with a group of guys, big rappers and DJs to the city, do these huge parties, and really learned that we wanted to serve people through experiences. And then just out of college, I was in the nutrition space, kind of franchise land, uh, with a company that did 100% of brand and marketing in house. And they did 80% of their own procurement. So over the course of two years, I got a fast track of exposure and experience and what it looks like to develop products. And I really became focused on the relationship that that uh, brand shared with consumers. So, so I, that's, kind of, that's how we maybe like built up the gusto to step into something like good wipes and yeah we've just been chipping away for the past eight years I, i'm curious on the the contracting side were you clipping the margin and keeping it or were you passing it along to your dad oh no i was yeah <laughs> <laughs> see there there you go like that's yeah that's smart i i see that in in just like consulting and contracting you like get your rate and then find someone subcontract out a bit lower clip that margin and then like you're printing 100 percent, 100 percent. yeah uh I don't like my identity is not work, my identity is not money, but I don't want money to be a barrier mm. for experiences and caring for people. So yeah. I you know I do and I think we're we're created to build and to create and to serve and to love. And if, if you can look at your work in that lens, it becomes super fun really quickly. So you uh, now during this this time, like right before you started, I guess right before you went out on your own, did you have any 
mentors to look up to like i mean you said your dad was was doing the contracting thing so i guess he's technically you know he's working for himself doing his own thing and you have you see the hustle there but were there people outside of maybe the family sphere where you looked up to what they were doing or building or how they were building it yeah no that's great i think you might even get something i love these conversations and uh kind of the guy that's He's laughing, thinking of it because when I meet somebody, I ask like a million questions. He's like, "No, this is this is Marcus's show." Like, it's Kim. <laughs> I'm always, I'm always so curious because when we think of like my dad as a mentor, it wasn't like, "Hey, you need to position yourself to be successful." It was these little character traits that I think develop into what it looks like to, to live in a lane of success or to like work towards uh, something that that works. Did, did you know? Outside of that, we had some mentors early on that we had one guy that rallied around us in a huge way. Uh, we, my business partner Sam, his dad had like this monthly, like, doers roundtable where they would like share ideas and like make connections between each other. And he was like, hey, like these guys, I need to go investing. You guys should go pitch them. And we're hired up. We have no business in the room. We, we didn't, have, we didn't have a product, a concept, and some really crappy art. We go in this room, and these guys that are a little, they're like, they're not into like a mode of selling, right? It's, it's black and white, it's actually black and white. Hey, these products will make you feel clean, and they will make you feel confident. And they're like, you think you're selling confidence? They're 100%. And they're like, no shot. Guys, we'll never, this will never work. And we got, we literally got pulled out. And, Two things happened. One guy took us out to lunch a week later, and he said, hey, I, I know that was pretty heavy. He's like, but don't look at everything that you've done negatively. negatively. Look at it as part, part of your journey and a gift to get you to where you are today. We hmm. always, that's how we always consider everything, right? Like things happen for us, you know, to us. And that was like a reframe for us very early on. And then there was another guy from that group that, but a relative degree of success, multiple businesses, and for whatever reason, he rallied around us for a couple of years. And his main thing was more around like the finance side, finding focus, knowing our numbers. And we did it for the first few years, but he had the grace and the patience and the empathy to be with us like quarterly. And that, like, still I think about this guy, his name's Scott Levin. And I, he was like one of the few that believed in us early. It means a lot. Mm. Do you find yourself now that you've had these people that you're, you know, if, if somebody younger, somebody who is in a newer space and trying to establish themselves, do you, do you try to be what those people were to you? 100%. And I think more so, like, I think if I do a lot of goal setting, I do four buckets, I do personal, professional, playful people. And in there, I, I have, I want, I want better mentors in my life. Like kind of the other side of that is, I shouldn't say better. I want more and more specific. I have like some great people in my corner, but when I look at like my overall network, it probably does look more on the side of me wanting to pour into people because outside of like this other guy, we didn't really have a ton of them. Mm. So I think, yeah, like I'm in my early thirties now and I want to be like the leader for guys in their 20s that I wish I had in place. Now, b without jumping too far ahead here, you just you had brought up like uh, your meeting with like some venture capitalists, and I think that ultimately, as, and the and the in industry seems to be changing a bit, but you were probably pitching older men in their 50s or something, and with a product okay. that you had that requires re-educating an entire young population that might be more open to the idea, it's a tough sell mm -hmm. to that, that demographic of, of men that are that age. Big time, yeah. So when we started this, we started life and we said it's for guys only started. But the buyers in those categories are the same people buying paper, paper towels, napkins, paper plates. It's almost in such like the most monetized and like old school category in retail 
so we're pitching through the very we're pushing these people to get on shelves and they're like i have a very fast property here it doesn't need to be, we don't need to we don't need to it because it's not broken so then early on it's your feminine hygiene much more progressive category. the buyers were younger they were into the tone they understood, it, they understood like, our emotive position and they, they invited us in mm. we were able to kind of prove ourselves in feminine hygiene which has never transcended kind of a, a more old school old guard category. yeah so I'm, I'm jumping around here so you so you start uh you, you are in a fraternity and i believe the idea was born out of something of the effect the bathrooms just being disgusting and you had literal like what baby wipes in a in a ziploc bag like how were you like wh- where did the genesis of the idea come from uh to like we need an easier way to do this yeah so habitual baby birth right i've never kicked that out. and somewhere as a baby your butt was wiped baby wipes mm. and somebody started a lot and told you that you should use toilet paper it's an ineffective tool it doesn't get the job done well and that was just something that stuck with me and also sam for a long time so when we met in college we had this really bizarre idea team that we thought was kind of a personal and no one else shared and there was this day where we were walking in the bathroom we bumped shoulders we looked down we were both holding we squeezed back as a baby wipe <laughs> And we say in that moment, we bonded over butt wipes. And from then on, we were known as the white guys. Wow. You can imagine like a 19 year olds in college, that meant nothing to us. But what we noticed were people were, they wouldn't even buy it. They would come in our rooms and steal our wipes. And then we would put our ear to the street and say, hey, I guess we're stealing our wipes. And say, we don't know where to buy them. When we find baby wipes, we're, we're embarrassed to purchase them. Mm. And then, to your point on the on the Ziploc bag, we would literally put wipes in Ziploc bags and take them out with us on dates or out to the bar. And what we learned was that like when confidence and cleanliness matters most oftentimes out of the house, they want packaging solutions to support the active and on the go all the time. So years down the road, we recognize that like, we can build a brand that really serves uh, people in their lanes and their lives and also support it in packaging solutions that uh, go where they go. Mm. So do you think there was a there was a bit of of kind of self-consciousness or like the feet the need to hide what what you were doing before you found your partner that was like doing the same thing in secret as almost like an underground society that you had going on there? 100 percent. 100 percent. Yeah. In that, so when we bump shoulders I'm, I can be pretty, young, but Sam is like, oh, wow. and in my mind, I'm like, dude, what are you going to out of this house? What are you going to be ready to go? Like, we can't let anybody know. And he starts like pounding his chest. He's like, we got to let everybody know. <laughs> and we're like, all right, like, whatever. So we went on this crusade, and we were living in a house with 60 guys. And within 30 days, we had all 60 guys wiping and eating. Wow. Uh, so yeah, it definitely started as like, like a little secret that we would put in the corner. Uh, but once we started sharing it, people would adopt it and give it the confidence and gusto of the conversation. Mm. So at that moment, you realize that like there's a market for this, and the market that's currently available or that is currently online, there's nothing similar to what you're doing. And so obviously there's a huge opportunity there, but being one of the first to a market can also be a huge challenge. So can mm. you talk about some of those like challenges that you first uh, first encountered? Yeah. So I would say, and it helped us then, but it helped us now. I would say we're a fast follower for like a better for you brand and a, a brand that like connects and gets its community consumers in that, in like the paper space. Right. So you have Cotton now, you have Charmin, a lot of like private label, white label stuff in the aisles. Uh, but the Dude Wipes actually launched two years ahead of us. We didn't know this from the the first few months that we started, we saw the brand come up. Both were embryonic. They don't need a little more traction than we did. Uh, but we're also serving different consumer sets. So didn't really think, think much, much about it. And for the first few years, I think we're still kind of like clawing for traction. It, it meant nothing. But once they, a couple years ahead of us, started getting shelf weight and 
started working, uh, yeah, we were just like, hey, like look at these people, serving people in a different way, adding a little flavor and color to like a very stale and stagnant uh, category. We can do that and we can do that for different consumers. Mm. So, like a big part of our story early on in getting it was like, hey, for the longest time, this has been like very gender neutral and it's been very vanilla box and one size fits all. When you as a buyer brought in dues, you declared that gender norms matter. Mm. Whether we believe that or not, like it, it's irrelevant, but that's that's the viewpoint of the consumer and the chopper. And our position is like, hey, if we're saying that guys matter, we would say that girls matter too. Mm. And that's our like, that's where we want to help participate, drive, drive people and choppers to the aisle and to the category. Now, you have like the traditional behemoths, Procter & Gamble, you know, the, the, the big players, as you start to get traction, do you see uh, any shifts in their behavior as far as them uh, now targeting your market segment? Because their, their go-to-market strategy and speed is just obviously a lot faster than, than what you're going to be able to do since they have, you know, the supply chain locked down, the manufacturing, everything. Do you see them mm -hmm. ever try to peek into the market? And do you get worried in that when you see that if it happens? Yeah, so they're in the market, mm. right? I mean, like, Cottonelle's number one, and they're rocking and rolling. Uh, there's, a, there's a lot of big CPG brands that, that we are currently beating. A couple things that for us that we look at. One, the paper category is huge, and this, like, flushable life segment is super small for, this, for big CPG. So they don't have as many eyes on it. Two, while they roll out supply chain a little faster, when it comes to language and position, they could talk for two years. Hmm. Right? We could chop that up and literally in like a 15-minute meeting and have it in market in 60 to 90 days. But I do think that that's uh, an advantage of emerging brands and their ability to flex and pivot the market. Um, like I, there's been this float that's kind of going on the office a lot lately. And I think it's uh, David... Grohl, Grohl, hmm. one of the Nirvana guys. Yep. And he said that when you write a song, you write it for a reason. And you sing that song to, 80, to an arena of 85,000 people. And that arena of 85,000 people will sing the same song back to you, but for 85,000 different reasons. Hmm. Right? Yeah. And so it's, when you send something out to the world, it becomes theirs. And as emerging brands, have an opportunity to really put our ear to the street and understand what's making people think. Like, what are super heavy users loving about our products? And then leaning into those things specifically. We can do that at a much faster rate than the big guys. And then, so on a competition, I think we're at an advantage there. And then on the, on the flip side, when we look at categories across all of retail, they've, been, they've become much more fragmented over the years with the uh, like um, what's the, the development of emerging mints, right? Like you, it's a consumer democracy, and people buy minted because they they like what you guys stand for, they like the way it feels, and they connect with like your lifestyle. Like I assume that a lot of people that are in your brand, like they probably push themselves physically. They're probably pretty emotional communicators. They like a lot of this same design and aesthetic, and that's why they come. Mm. If they don't like that, they're going to go somewhere else. So ten, a decade ago, you have all these options and categories, and categories were run by two or three billion dollar brands. You believe that they're going to be run by 50, 20, 100, 150 million dollar brands. Mm. So, so when you uh, got started, like, were you... I know for us, we're only direct to consumer, like everything's through the website. And I think that inherently builds in a bit of margin that I can, can use for as wiggle room. Were, was that your kind of go to market strategy or did you try to go the traditional retail where I know you can get squeezed a bit uh, route? Yeah. So I don't think I'm the, I'm the smartest guy in the room. And, but I do think my competitive advantage is endurance and perseverance. Hmm. And we'll just we'll swing on whatever. And we didn't really have a plan when we started. When we started. <laughs> We're like, hey, this is cool. We love it. We had a little bit of money so I was like coming on it. And through trial and error, we learned where this brand works. And you know, 
you're selling a premium item at a higher price point. You have, compared to like your fixed costs, you have a lot more upside than we do when it comes to like shipping and feeling a lot of SGNA. Hmm. Uh, so we learned early on that a lot of the digital stuff was super, was super tough for us, hmm. right? Like we probably have a similar CAC, but, and we probably have similar fixed freight costs. Yeah. But my product is a fraction of yours. Hmm. Uh, so what we've done is we have actually focused on brick and mortar and retail in very specific categories where people are shopping to do this job and in channels where there's a high level of shopping frequency in the aisle. Like for example, feminine hygiene, we don't pitch any grocery feminine hygiene because no one's shopping feminine hygiene at grocery. Hmm. But we pit like we're in mass and in drug because that's where people actually shop for it. Took a long time for us to Yeah, yeah. I mean, that makes complete sense. Now, do you see, I know store, say a store like Sephora isn't, isn't like prototypically feminine hygiene, but I almost feel as though your consumer is there buying stuff to, you know, makeup and generally other stuff in the same sphere. Is that, is that a space you would play in or do you stick to to more like pharmacy um, in, in stores like that, like Target, et cetera. Yeah, so our focus is mass and grocery. Mm. Hands down, it's, we have, like, we have a, a volume and velocity play. Now, a store like Sephora is an awesome way for us to activate new like, consumers and new shoppers. What we've struggled with in the past with uh, limited brand activity is if you're not going to shop there, they're probably not going to recognize it there a lot of times, uh-huh. and it would be very hard for us to perform in a way that would make you buy a buy. So that's something we've kind of pushed to the side, it's, and that idea has really emerged a little bit. But we're just more focusing right now on where people are shopping. Hmm. So um, now I know one of the things I've talked about a lot with the brand where it's at. And I've only, you know, we've only been around for 13 months, but working capital becomes increasingly um, like almost sparse when you're outlaying stuff for manufacturing. And I don't know, you know, how uh, crazy it was for you at the in the beginning. But did you ever have to raise capital uh, to kind of pad your working capital? or How did you navigate that? Because it's something I'm currently navigating and it seems almost daunting at times uh trying to tiptoe around keeping enough working capital you know bankrolled yeah i know it's tough i'll tell you what we did i recommend it (laughs) it's it's funny (laughs) i have a hard time being in good wipes isn't done it's like it's it's not totally it feels like it's working I, I believe it. I believe it can work. It says every founder, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, and we do have a, an awesome story, and our community consumers love us. But there's still opportunities. So it's like I would, I would do it that. I was like, hey, this is how we did it. Like, we do it, and it ends up like not working. Yeah. Uh, we did we went on a. I don't know what this guy called it. But we pulled out like a hundred thousand dollars. Now, if if you can show a return on that, easy. Like if, if you know your CAC and you have like all that stuff out, and you can show a return, I would say like debt finance all day. We couldn't at the time. Hmm. So like a couple years ago, that put us in a tough position. Uh, so I mean, rates are so low right now. Like lenders, they are begging people to take money. I mean, that is a that's a big play, especially with a lot of these cards. Especially ones with high limit, mm-hmm. they're at like zero percent finance for the first year. Uh, you apply for them all in one day, and you get some pretty high numbers. That's a way. Again, unless you have a, a path to profitability ROI, I wouldn't recommend it. Uh, we used a company called Cabin early on. I don't know if they're still around, but they have like small business loans uh, for like emerging brands, and there's PayPal has some pretty interesting offerings too. We did that for the first few years. Then we did some some angel stuff, but I think a lot of people try pitching before they have a, a clarity themselves, mm. right? People want to see that you have a high degree of confidence in where you're going and, re- and relative clarity. Yeah, 
I know Marcus and I, we always talk about like, you know, with working capital, it's like, oh, the next drop, it'll give us more room to breathe. And then you, you do the next drop and all of a sudden you need to scale even more. And then it turns out you don't have the, all the money you want. Does that, does it ever change? It seems like it's just a continual <laughs> process of needing more and more and more and more money. Yeah. So I think about this a lot. <laughs> The word, so you talk about growth, right? When, when you use the word growth, it, it can't be in the same conversation as comfort, right? They're like oil and water, oil mix. So if you say you want to grow, you are accepting the fact that you're going to be uncomfortable. Hmm. If you don't want to grow, then it, it could be easy, right? Like you're not going to put as much pressure on everything that you're building. Um, but yeah, growth, growth takes pressure, it takes friction. And I think that that's your. I think that as you you develop a lot of things in your person more through, through just reps. Mm. I, so yeah, I I like that a lot because I think I think it also that in that in those pressure moments you kind of you end up learning a lot about the business because you any missteps really can harm um, the business a lot. And you're trying your best not to make any, but obviously you're, you're going to, and one of the biggest things that I have hanging over me outside of Sean, uh, is like that first employee hire. Um, now uh-huh. you had, you had your co-founder, but, and as you know, like the first person you bring on is going to have to wear a lot of hats. So did you target expertise in the consumer package goods space that they had or was it more of like a young scrappy person that was just going to wear all the hats and learn as you go yeah so our first person Maria, she's still with us uh, she's the creative director and we knew that we wanted to work with her. we were pitching all of for the first time and we knew we nothing we had no design capabilities. <laughs> she was doing some copywriting for us and she was like, all right i learned a little bit about it and she was able to chop it up she worked so literally like three or four nights out, like eleven or twelve nights in a row before this pitch. Wow. And we would go we would go home for like four hours, we come back to the office and chop it up. And we're like, all right, like not, she has that muscle and she has an affinity for the brand for the reason where we're going. And that's I think early on, I'm gonna bifurcate this. <laughs> Story because like, we hear a lot of we hear a lot of stories that like it's, not, it's out of context, mm. right? Like when you're raising money, and I'll tie this back to hiring. It's either a founder story, it's either an uncompetitive or undeniable competitive advantage, right? Or it's a trash story. A founder story is someone who crashes into somebody, is an idea that crashes into somebody out of like a deep need or a trauma. Those are great stories. You just feel it coming out of people like, hey, I couldn't feed my baby because they had a cleft lip and I came up with this device, right? But seriously, like, this is how the best things are, are engineered. In the or a founder story, hey, my name's Charlie, I found a device and I loaded it to Procter & Gamble 15 years later, and here's my next idea. People are going to have massive value. Mm. I touch on that because if you have experience, and you can, you can communicate with clarity and confidence where you're going, I think you can get the specialist, and I would recommend the specialist. Mm. I don't know if early on, if you don't have a lot of clarity and you're still figuring it out, which is normal and fine, if you're going to be able to rally, a, like excite a specialist enough to jump in with you, mm. right? Because if they're specialists, they want a little direction. They're going to want some guardrails, and if you need to have that for yourself, you can't really have that for somebody else. Um, so I think... Early on, the gym is, is always a solid play, especially if you're not funded. And yeah, work ethic, it's, it's a lot of missed friends. Mm. So I, I talked about in the beginning of the show, uh, re-education um, of, of consumers. And I know that um, that's generally expensive. I don't know how, how did you go about it because I, I did you use a mix of like social media and traditional marketing or was it a lot of just uh, uh, marketing spend on listen like guys you can use these wipes too like come on now because I, I mean it's it's more commonplace to see you know you have 
uh, you guys, you have dude wipes. You see, you, you're you're more surrounded with the. Um, it's it's more commonplace. But when you were starting out, it, it certainly wasn't. Oh no! I mean, so we always say when when we started out, um, like guys practicing hygiene was called metrosexual. <laughs> it, yes. Yeah. Right. It's called men's room, and it's like it's very approachable, very accepted. Um, yeah, and I think it's like we're selling butt wipes. We're building like a lifestyle around it and a brand world around it that's inviting and lets everyone know that it's okay, number one. And number two, like it's just doing the job better. With all these analogies, mm. of, like if a bird pooped on your arm, you're outside, you're at the beach, bird pooped on your arm, would you take like your towel and wipe it <laughs> and just call it a day? No, you'd probably go down to the ocean get a little water on it, you take your towel, or you get something wet and like really clean it. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, there's just like a lot of pragmatic thought in doing this job that's pretty simple. We're comfortable in investing in education because we do have a high rate, mm -hmm. and we know we have a fantastic job. Mm -hmm. uh, so what like, typically people try to end up adopting the particular team. Six or seven years ago, I imagine it, it, it would have been a lot harder because nowadays especially, it, you know, people are trending, especially younger people, into like skincare routines, and it's all over the place. It's it's a huge uh, like on social media. So, have you noticed that it's gotten a bit easier to get through to those people, or or, di or different demographics of people? Like, talk about that. Yeah, I think it's a pretty approachable, right? Like people, people also like to be different, hmm. right? And that's part of our brand. Our brand a little bit, it's, it's still early on. It's still embryonic. There, we're still in this early adopter phase. It's a lot of, we're attracting a lot of people like you guys and like the people that you guys are attracting are attracting. It's like people that want to be at the forefront of innovation and change. And these people are typically seen. So like they're looking for the thing that when they share with their friends, their friends are like, dude, that's weird. Like that fires this community. Up. They want to be the weird. <laughs> uh, and yeah, so I think it's, we just we just kind of lean into that. I I think that comment right there, that like, dude, that's weird. As much mm -hmm. as I hate it, actually, yeah, no, I ha I hate it, and it's also working against like so much because if you think about this, the core center of the product is just like helping you be a bit more clean it's like dude how is that even weird like i just exactly. want to be i want my it's the same thing as skincare for men like i just want to take care of my facial skin like what is this weird about that you know yes if you gave two options of like having you know a bad breakout that could be prevented or not like just because it's weird like i still would like to believe most people would choose you know have better skin oh man 100 um so i i was doing some research and saw that you guys took a deal with Walmart uh, pretty early on. Um, okay. And I Where wanted. What? I, I this got is good. Where did you I've got Google. <laughs> okay, bro. Don't don't doubt it. Okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I, and I believe it was something like uh, 500 stores. Now, for anybody that is starting a brand, that's like the mecca, right? It's it's Walmart, like whatever, but mm -hmm. um, there's more that goes on to that uh, behind the scenes. So I'm curious if you would go that route again, or would you more try to build it out through uh, strictly like online e-com, e I guess, where you're distributing your own your own stuff? Hmm. I, I mean, dude, again, for us, not to us, right? I think it's hard to say. Looking back, that's like the mech. I, in my mind, I'm like, no, that's too much. <laughs> so the story, I don't know in the story, but Walmart was our first big retailer. They gave us 500 doors across the country, no, no geographical concentration. Literally a death a brand that has no brand. Mm. But in our minds, we're like, well, maybe like, people are going to love the product, and the tries it, loves it, it's fantastic. And, I mean, we got bare. <laughs> they, they gave us two years. We just got trapped. Mm. However, the flip side of that is Target saw it and they were like, we want that in our stores. 
And at that time, like the Target shopper was a little bit more progressive in the category. Mm-hmm. I wouldn't say that that's necessarily true today, but at that time. So Target got us on with the Walmart. And actually, what's happening is I'm having a conversation with Walmart, and they're like, you're fired. No one knows this yet. <laughs> See it for like four or six months. And then Target's like, hey, you look what you're doing at Walmart. Can you do that with us? They're like, for sure. <laughs> like, uh, and then, yeah, so then we put Target shelves, we unloaded Walmart shelves, and then we found good focus with Target. We leaned in there for a while. Now, we share a lot of the same design to shopper and consumer. We learned a lot about the brand and who we were serving. So you're, you're, you have a continuing relationship with Target to, to, to this day? Oh, yeah. Oh, that's so awesome. We love them. I mean, we we actually, in feminine hygiene, no, we have a skew that outperforms every wipe in the category. That's wow. amazing. In terms of units. That's amazing. Yeah, that is that is insane. So, and and are, are you guys on Amazon at all? Like, I, like yeah, about thirty three percent of our business. That that makes sense. So, I, are you using the fulfilled by Amazon model where they're just fulfilling for you? You just send the product to them. So. We're not now. We've done it. We've done every model. Of them. Mm. We've done three P and so like third party and sold through FBA. We we did a stint one P where they were buying from us. Which if there is an Amazon buyer listening to this conversation, we would love to reinvestigate that conversation. Uh, but currently, we have partnership and investment from a company called Capital. Mm. They're a the largest reseller on the domestic reseller on the platform. They buy and they buy and hold from us like a retailer would, and okay. then they sell on behalf of Packable. Mm, so it's through now. I, you don't have to get in specifics if you don't want to, but is sure. it through Packable's Amazon store or your Amazon store? So we have an Amazon store, ah. but it's sold by. Now that's Packable. yeah, that's cool. I would, yeah, because yeah. it's a space I haven't explored, but obviously Amazon is one of those behemoths like Walmart where you just are getting eyes on your product that might not normally be eyes on your product through recommendations okay. and their engine and stuff like that. So I imagine there's, yeah, you said over 30% of, of your business. So that's that's yeah. really good. Going, it doesn't have the best content, but, yeah. but you can't be the awareness of discovery. Mm. It's awesome. Going back to that that Walmart deal where you know you, you got this huge offer, you're super pumped up, and then all of a sudden it, it's not going the way you initially were like hoping. What mm-hmm. what did you did you have to like go back to the drawing board, figure out exactly what you needed to do in order for people to start recognizing the product in Walmart, or like what was kind of your thought process? Like, okay, it's not working initially, but like how can we make this work? And and wh- when we go into t- when Target approaches you, how can we make sure it works with Target so you know you don't end up with the Walmart situation? <laughs> yeah. So the big takeaway of Walmart was we either if if we're not going to go national which we with target we're like hey we don't like the firing power to serve that appropriately we like to pick like strong geo markets where we can focus on concentration mm. that was the big takeaway there and during it, even we didn't know what was happening for the first five years like we didn't even we, like we didn't even have time to really think like, oh how do we make walmart better like, how do we pay anybody right like how do we we ended up, I mean, on that deal, we probably shipped, I don't know, we ended up, uh, to ship to Walmart, I, we air created the inventory and we have a uh, manufacturing partner in China, we have one in China, California, and one in Minneapolis, and this came from China. And the lead time got kind of funky, or she moved this set up, and we spent like, this is her, we spent a hundred grand on inventory just to get the product like to get it there, because if we did it, we would have missed the shot of the title, right? Yeah. Uh, and yeah, like that was like our working at the time. And so we then like, all right, now we're going to brand that this is going to work. And you just learn from that kind of stuff. But mm. I, I, hindsight's always funny for me. And it, I think there's a story where Jake goes in when he jumped on the Zika, he goes in to the Coke headquarters here in Atlanta, and he's pitching their, their and at least Jeffrey, but again, uh, you know that it takes eight to build a brand. I don't think a lot of people, when they sign up to build something, 
are ready to kick rocks for eight years. <laughs> We've been doing this for eight years and it's still very challenging. But I would say that like seven, eight year mark is when we started feeling like we have some control. We know it works. We know like where our net are. Mm. Happens a lot faster for some people, but I think that's like kind of a fallacy that we're fed through social media more often than that. Yeah. I, I think social media is inherently dangerous for entrepreneurship because it, it glamorizes a lot of just BS that doesn't exist in real life. Like when you're in the nitty gritty, it's like it's yes. like people just pretty much selling snake oil and just renting Lamborghinis and stuff. And it's just not that. <laughs> it's not that. Um, in, in five to 10 years, like uh, long term for the brand, are you just focusing on? your core competencies now uh, are you going to be expanding product lines uh, down the road i mean obviously if stuff's secret don't you don't have to mention it but i imagine you'll probably grow your your product lines a bit yeah i think you know right now we're we're focusing on the performance and the health of our key accounts we have this kind of this mantra of velocity over variety there's still a lot of upside with where we're at hmm. um we will, we're looking at innovation at, at the second half of this year. And I think innovation sometimes has like a really weighty kind of a conscious with it. It doesn't have to be like the bag dissolves over that your toilet in 30 days. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, it, it can be flavor, position, packaging solution. Uh, but I think definitely right now, we're still, like we always hear early on, like, to focus on like, your core winners. We're still like owning that muscle as a company. So we're still cutting stuff, focusing on the things that work. We have brought like washes and scrubs to feminine hygiene mm. really well. And that was all data driven on like what shoppers were demanding and why people were buying this. And then, yeah, five years, man. Good wipes will be synonymous with wet wipes. Okay. Like, that might be in 20 years, but that's where we're going. And like whether I'm here at that time and this team is still here, I believe that this brand will really stand the test of time. And when you say, hey, pass me the wet wipes, it's like people grab the good wipes. And hopefully they're saying pass me the wet wipes. Yeah, exactly. Uh, think of that the next issue relationship. That's that's the uh, the ultimate goal, right? I remember I, the, in the one marketing class I think I paid attention to in college, it was like once your brand becomes synonymous with the product, that's when you're yeah. you're good forever. You're, you're, yeah. yeah. Um, well, listen, Charlie, I don't want to take up too much of your time. I know it's a work day and, uh, and you're a busy guy. So I appreciate you hopping on here. Um, please yes. plug anything uh, here. And I'll obviously include stuff in the description as far as links to your products, etc. But if there's anything you cool. want to plug that you don't think I'll, I'll hit on, feel free. Um, yeah, thanks again. Yeah, had a blast. Uh, Pumped to continue to watch you guys film. I love the way that you that you guys document it. I think it goes a long way in building, uh, building a community. It's, it's cool to see. Awesome. Well, thank you again, cool, and uh, we'll uh, we'll chat soon. Love it, see Sean. Pleasure. We'll chat. Ciao. Take care.